That was as follows. The tomb robbers had been careless in closing the tomb. It was at night, and they were in a hurry. At the crack of dawn, Charius turned up at the tomb, ostensibly to offer wreaths and libations, but in fact with the intention of doing away with himself. He could not bear being separated from Calerho and thought that death was the only thing that would cure his grief. When he reached the tomb, he found that the stones had been moved and the entrance was gone, was open. He was astonished at the sight and overcome by fearful perplexity at what had happened. Rumor, a swift messenger, told the Syracusans this amazing news. They all quickly crowded round the tomb, but no one dared go inside until Hermocrates gave an order to do so. The man who was sent in reported the whole situation accurately. It seemed incredible that even the corpse was not lying there. Then Charius himself determined to go in, in his desire to see Calerho again even dead. But though he hunted through the tomb, he could find nothing. Many people could not believe it and went in after him. They were all seized by helplessness. One of those standing there said, the funeral offerings have been carried off it is tomb robbers who have done that, but what about the corpse? Where is it? Many different suggestions circulated in the crowd. Charias looked toward the heavens, stretched up his arms, and was carried off, and cried, Which of the gods is it, then, who has become my rival in love, and carried off Calerho, and is now keeping her with him, against her will, constrained by a more powerful destiny. That is why she died suddenly, so that she would not realize what was happening. That is how Dionysus took Ariadne from Thesis, and how Zeus took Semele. It looks as if I had a goddess for a wife without knowing it. Someone above my station. But she should not have left the world so quickly, even for such a reason. Thetis was a goddess, but she stayed with Peleus, and he had a son by her. I have been abandoned at the very height of my love. What is to happen to me? What is to become of me, poor wretch? Should I do away with myself? And who would share my grave? I did have this much to look forward to in my misfortune that if I could not continue to share Calerho's bed, I should come to share her grave. My lady, I offer my justification for living. You force me to live, because I shall look for you on land and sea and in the very sky if I can reach there. This I beg of you, my dear. Do not flee from me. At this the crowd broke out in lamentation. Everyone began to lament for Calerho as though she had just died. Triremes was were Triremes were launched at once, and many men shared the search. For Sicily, Hermocrates himself conducted the investigation. Charius took North Africa. Some were sent to Italy. Others were instructed to cross the Ionian Sea. While human efforts were altogether ineffectual. It was fortune who brought the truth to light. Fortune, without whom nothing ever comes to completion, as one can see from what happened. The tomb robbers left Miletus when they had sold the woman, a hard cargo to dispose of, and headed for Crete. They were told that it was a prosperous and large island and hoped they would be able to find buyers for their cargo without difficulty. But a strong wind caught them and drove them into the Ionian Sea, where they wandered in unfrequented waters. The villains were caught in thunder and lightning and lasting darkness. Providence was demonstrating that it was Calerho who had brought them fair sailing before. Each time they came close to death, the god would not accord them quick release from their fear 
but made their shipwreck drag out. Dry land would not accept the villains, and as they rode at sea for a long time, they came to lack the necessities of life, especially water. Their ill-gotten wealth availed them nothing. Amid gold, they were dying of thirst. Slowly, they came to repent of their reckless behavior and reproach one another, saying that it had brought them no profit. Now the rest were all dying of thirst, but Theron proved a rogue even in that crisis. He contrived to steal some of the water, thieving from his fellow thieves. He thought he had done something clever, of course, but the fact was it was Providence's doing. She was keeping him for torture and crucifixion. What happened was that Charius's ship came upon the pirate's cutter as it was wandering about erratically, but at first steered away, thinking it was a pirate craft. But when it became clear that it had no pilot and was drifting aimlessly as the waves drove against it, one of the Tyremi's crew cried, There isn't anyone on board. No need to be frightened. Let's pull alongside and find out what the mystery is. The helmsman agreed. Charius was the body of the ship weeping was in the body of the ship weeping, his head covered up. When they drew alongside, at first they hailed the crew. When no one answered, a man from the Triremi boarded the ship, but all he saw was gold and dead bodies. He told his fellows, who were delighted, they found themselves lucky finding a fortune at sea. This caused a commotion, and Charius asked what the matter was. When he was told, he wanted to see this strange sight for himself. When he recognized the funeral offerings, hey baby, he tore his clothes and uttered a loud piercing cry. Ah, Callerho, these are yours. This is the wreath I put on your head. Your father gave you this, your mother this. This is your bridal dress. The ship has turned into your tomb, but I can see your things, but where are you? The tomb's contents are all there, except the body. Theron heard this and lay there like the dead. In fact, he was half dead. He fully intended not to utter a sound or move a muscle since he was well aware what would happen. But human beings are born with a love of life. Not even in the worst disaster do we despair for a change for the better. The God who made the world has implanted this specious notion in all of us so that we will not run away from a life of misery. So Theron in the grip of thirst, first uttered, Drink! When he had been given something to drink and received every attention, Charia sat down beside him and asked him, Who are you, men? What have you done with the woman? What, where did you get these things? Where are you sailing to? What have you done with the woman they belong to? Theron summoned all his unscrupulous cunning. I am a Cretan, he said, and I am sailing to Ionia to look for my brother, who is a soldier. I was left behind by the ship's crew in Cephalania when they left there in a hurry and joined this ship, which called in there, conveniently for me. But we were driven out into these waters by violent winds. Then we were becalmed for a long time, and everyone died of thirst except me. I survived because of my piety. When Charias heard this, he gave orders for the Triremi to take the cutter in tow until they reached the harbor in Syracuse.